Welcome. My name is Dennis. I'm from Ventus. Uh, Ventus is based in Hamburg in Germany. And we are a company that has right now three products up and running. The one is the designer where you create content, for example, for broadcast, for uh, presentations, for kiosk, kiosk applications, touch applications. You can have video vaults up and running with Ventus. And the unique thing with Ventus is you can have video vaults with a cluster setup. That means you can have, have uh, for example, 20 machines. Each machine has four outputs in full HD. And then you throw that on a video wall, and each screen has a full resolution setup. All the graphics, everything is then running absolutely synchronously on the video walls, including then you can have, for example, external um, sensors like a radar touch, uh, which scans the whole area, and then you can touch the buttons and play back, therefore, your events or videos. So what you see here already is also a presentation made in Ventus. It's uh, all real-time 3D graphics. So that's the core of Ventus. All you see is every time real-time. So let's start a bit. To show you a bit about my company, it's um, a small show reel I've pre uh, prepared already. And again, what is Ventus? We are the real-time 3D rendering engine. Um, we are in the broadcast market. You can do presentation, video awards, projection mapping, and have also interactive applications. So here are some examples from our clients. And I tell you, these are really huge projects, as you see. There you see projection mapping on top is a projector, and it is completely projecting on a, a real surface. People can then use a touch screen in front of these real surfaces and control the content, run and play back videos, or get uh, informations for their products. Also very common it is that uh, keynotes are run with Ventus. So you have a huge video wall, a speaker like me in front, and he can then interoperate with any kind of interface, uh, inter, uh, 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 device like a clicker or using motion detection. And the scene will then play back any kind of content accordingly to the clicks or uh, to any other event. So when I say we can have external sensors and things connected to Ventus, that means we are absolutely rendering everything in real time. And you can also exchange content like text and graphics also in real time. Um, we can use external data uh, to deliver you any kind of information like positions of objects. Uh, you can have any kind of uh, databases read out and output these data then in real time on your graphics. So what has this to do with Cinema 4D? Well, in the broadcast market, uh, it is very common to have AR or VR elements, like you have, uh, for example, things on the ground appearing, um, having things like election graphics on the ground appearing in front of the talent. And such things needs to be created in also external applications like Cinema 4D. Um, we have created a life link between Ventus and Cinema 4D to have a better workflow and easier workflow for all the artists outside there. What you see here, for example, is a holographic demo. We have a company in Russia that uh, realized a real cool holographic display showroom um, where they created many layers of transparent walls where they then showcase their content on. And you have the imagination or the feeling that things are really uh, in 3D in the room. So whenever you change your perspective or your view, it appears that the things are really like uh, parallax occlusion um, moving. Also very common it is uh, to have the automotive industry um, use our Ventus system for things like you see here. Uh, this is an example where we use a real car 
on a rotational pot and then overlay all the graphic effects on top. And everything is running in real time. So that means tracking cameras can move around the set and track the objects and the uh, main objects like this car in this example, deliver the data into Ventus, and Ventus then overlays the graphics. Here's another example from equipment. This is a uh, robot controlled arm. And on the upper right corner, you see the virtual elements. So this is a, even a more common example, like you have weather panels or panels in the background for a talent and news or whatever else. The green screen in the background is then used to key out uh, the green, and then it will show a virtual set on the background. This example here is made, the tracking is made with Trackman. The graphics are delivered from a customer from us, Glare Productions. And they have used an AR table, um, use a tracking system to have these figures on top of the table. And also, this football player in the front right corner um, to show one of the players on the field. All the elements you see here are running through different kind of machines. So we have one master machine that gets all the controls and sends out all the events to the other machines. And therefore, you are able to also show statistics of a football match, for example. So you see in the background of the video wall, the same data appears as the one you have now as AR elements in front. So you can have then dynamic game statistics. And the same goes for this AR table. The guy is moving now um, election graphics and is also able to stack them over each other. So all these graphic elements are nice to see, but they need one tool to create these graphics. For simple primitive objects, you can use Ventus, no question. You can create boxes, cubes, and stuff like that apply a texture, and you have nice elements like a touch button, like you see down here for my video player. But the rest of the graphics has to be made, for example, with Cinema 4D. So we support all the import formats, which are uh, really common right now, like FBX, DAE, also GLTF. And for the upcoming version, we will support GLTF with skinning and bones, which is really cool to have characters animated right now. So, and you save a lot of hard disk and, for example, RAM on the graphics card or for the CPU. So, because the animations are very, very slim. This is, for example, my workflow I have done for um, a tracking test I had to do for League of Legends in Berlin for Riot Games. So, the idea was I have two football players hitting each other, and therefore I needed to create the model um, inside of Cinema 4D, and I also had to rig everything inside of Cinema 4D. So the textures I've created in another application, like Substance Painter, but beforehand I prepared the whole model in Cinema 4D, texturized it completely, unwrapped everything so that I have unique space on my UV pages. Then I created the bones, as you see here, starting from the foot, going to the spines and the shoulders, and then the arms and the fingers. So this takes a lot of work to get this rigging and, uh, uh, properly. So in the end, we have now a nearly finished uh, rigged model. And all we need to do in the end is then adjust the weighting for each bone. So I was going over to the weighting tool from Cinema 4D. So here you see the complete rigging. The helmet is later on attached simply to the head. I needed to fine tune the hands, for example. So you see every finger bone is really taken into account so that my animation and my um, repositioning of the model works properly later on because I wanted uh, the, the football player to be able to really grab the football the one player has in his arm. So therefore, I really has to fine tune this rig a lot. So there we go. And then I was stepping over to skin and weight the character. 
I was using the weight tool in first and then adjusting all the bones and the skin to match properly the idea I want to have and the movements so that we don't have this uh, heavy wrinkles when the arm goes down as the character is right now in the rest pose. Using the weighting tool is very easy in Cinema 4D, by the way. So painting the weights and so on was a really, really, really quick thing. Um, but the fine tuning and adjusting adjustments for having the character in different ki kinds of extreme poses, that takes a while. But that is common workflow you have when you are a 3D artist. After I finished the wall uh, skin weighting, I had to move over and then I had to arrange and reposition the model. Since I want to have two football players on the field, um, I set them in, a, in the position I wanted to have, like the one is trying to capture the other guy and one of these guys has a football in the arms, so I connected the football simply um, to the one character. And as you see there with this uh, blue and the re red sphere, I wanted also to have a shatter effect as soon as the both heads hit each other. So the animation would be they hit each other and you see some splutters moving up from the helmet. So this looks very great. and. Keep in mind, the textures for this model has been in 8K resolution and using that in real time. So the cameraman is able to use the camera and go really close to the characters and has an absolutely brilliant detail texture as well as all these details like the splitters from the helmet. The animation itself is quite short. It's around about 130 frames in the end. and It's a repeative animation. And we had some more ideas like, OK, uh, we want to have these football players not simply appear and fade in on the stage later on. We also wanted to build them up. So it should look a bit technical. So I was using uh, the wireframe shader inside of Ventus, using an alpha mask, and have these guys blend up. And then the animation starts, and they hit each other. So basically, that's all you do in Cinema 4D to prepare the models for a real-time application. After you created these models, you have more options to get this stuff into Ventus. And what I was using is now the Cinema 4D Lifelink. With a Lifelink, you simply create um, a node, which is called Geometry Lifelink, and then you select in the lower right corner to establish the Lifelink between Cinema 4D and, 3D, uh, and, and Ventus. And the 3D models are now then in Ventus. To have the animations later on working, frame-based, I need to just export or uh, connect to Ventus and then click a button which is called Create Animations. And this creates a frame-based animations. So basically, it's around about 130 frames. And later on, you can decide when and how to play back this frame animation. I was not using keyframe animations inside of Ventus. This is also possible, by the way. To get the textures later on in Ventus, um, I was using uh, Substance Painter, exported the textures. The UV map's been already prepared in Cinema 4D, and it's quite simply dragging and dropping the uh, textures into Ventus. As you see here, this is a real life link. As soon as I move the time slider, you have seen that the characters on the right side also move whenever I use the time slider in Cinema 4D. These models are also very high polygonal, so therefore it takes a while until Ventus realizes there was a movement and a change in the, in the mesh. This is common. But later on, when we play back the animation, you see I have start and the end of the animation. Later on, when we use the animation inside of Ventus, this will play back absolutely fluid and very, very cool. This is now the Ventus result with finished textures, with the animation that the uh, player is going to get built up with a wireframe in the background, and so on and so on. Lighting is applied, and also shadowing is applied.
And as I told you, these are 4K textures for the heads, for the body, for the helmet, and so on. And therefore, you can have a real close-up look at these models later on to have a real cool model as an AR element. The whole setup and procedure inside of Cinema 4D took me around about three days. Um, the texturizing was done in less than one day since I already knew what I wanted to have. I just changed the colors for each player, which is a basic thing. And uh, the only difference is the number on the back and the text we have on top of, uh, of the back. So basically, these are the only differences in the textures. Um, I modified a bit the face so that they have a different look in the end. But it's, this is how the models are now looking in Ventus. So when we want to use them now for tracking, it is really simple. Since the models are already finished and prepared and everything is safe in Ventus, we can go over and have them live on stage. So we connected already to the TrackMed tracking system. And these are the model, models on stage in League of Legends just for the tracking test. Right now, you see that these models are more like swimming around. But this is a reason. Uh, the reason is that we did not fine tune the tracking right now. So this is the very, very first test. The same goes for the League of Legends models. These models being created in Cinema 4D have been completely rigged, and they have an animation applied like the idle animation or the taunt animation you see here right now. So basically, this is um, one mesh, one model. Um, the guns and everything are already attached to the model. We have a bullet coming and spitting out of the, of the gun as soon as uh, this, this lady is shooting and stuff like that. So this is a common case where uh, the Riot game guys um, are using Cinema 4D to create models. We can have a look at the skinning and weighting table. This is now for the right, uh, left hip bone then the legs, and so on and so on. So they are very clearly um, skinned and weighted. This model is now a low polygonal version, which is currently really taken out of the game, actually. So this is the whole skinned and rigged model. Do not underestimate the time and the fine-tuning you need to take to get these models properly mapped and rigged. So even for a low polygonal model, you need to spend a lot of time to have them correctly mapped, since the player wants to have an experience. So please take your time to model and especially to rig and weight the models correctly. So um, I would like to show you as well some more real life uh, footage by doing some actions now here on the laptop. We will have Cinema 4D and Ventus open right now. So this is the interface of the Ventus designer. Um, Ventus is a node-based program. That means all the things you do um, are node-based. So you create content by adding nodes to the scene, adding nodes, adding nodes, and then bind the logics later on that you want to have um, 
movement of the characters, that you want to have letters on the screen, that you want to have rectangles or boxes appear on the screen. You create the, all the logics for the touch buttons, for example, everything inside of Ventus. On the left side, you see that we have layers. So you can have different kind of layers, like 2D layers, 3D layers, scene layers, which loads another scene into an existing scene, and the Photoshop import. So for a 2D layer, you can have colors, gradients, images, movie clips, and also the live video input, for example. A 3D layer is uh, where the most stuff happens, actually. So even a flat rectangular button uh, will be created inside of the 3D layer, just for info. So Ventus is also capable of doing high dynamic range um, output. That means we can use HDR images and also output that in HDR, by the way. So when you create your first scenes, it's like you have the hierarchy here, where you create all the stuff that is more or less visible on the screen. On the right side, you have the content editor, where you create all the content uh, uh, control mechanisms, all the logics inside. And then you have the properties editor on the right. For sure, you have a renderer window, which is absolutely black right now, because we have no uh, content right now inside of Ventus. And you have the animation timeline, which is down here. So basically, when you create content in Ventus, it's like you drag and drop an axis on the screen, then another cube, for example, and you see the cube now on the screen. With the axis, you control the position where the uh, cube should appear. You can change then in the properties area what kind of scaling it should have, the rotation, and so on and so on. So it's quite easy, on one hand, to reposition objects and uh, give them a color and all these things. To have a bit of movement, for example, we can use the mover. And now I'm going to show you where the binding function of Ventus lies. So the point is, you have here all these properties, just for example, for the axis, the x, y, z for uh, the position, for the rotation, and the scaling. And you can bind every value to anything which is controlled now by the logics. For example, I can now bind this x position to the mover. And per default, this mover is set to have a, a value between minus 1 and 1 in one second. So in the output area, you're going to spot this value is moving. And by applying this binding between the axis and the mover, we have now this box moving around. And that's basically how you build up scenes. You bring in content, you create um, all the hierarchy inside the hierarchy editor, and then you create the bindings uh, inside of the logics part. You can control, like I mentioned already, all this stuff by a database, by any kind of input, by sensors, by, let's say, a radar touch that delivers you touch information, and therefore, this radar touch will send events that something gets triggered inside of Ventus. So this is how it works right now. So to show you a bit more about the Cinema 4D Live link, I created a simple null object and a cube. And I made the cube a child of the null object. And then I used the Ventus tags, which are a kind of plugin that you can install for Cinema 4D, and said with a blue icon that the null object is a root. And everything behind it, which is tagged with the Ventus tag, is now then transferred or live linked over to Ventus. You can use a custom uh, name for this object, as well as send it globally. Uh, send all the animations, transformations, the geometry itself, the camera and splines. So that means you can also create splines in Cinema 4D, hand them over to Ventus, and make use of the splines to animate objects along the spline, for example, or have particles running around that spline. We can also send over all the material colors and the textures, like standard uh, diffuse colors, the luminance, specular, specular masks, normal textures, displacement textures, and the diffuse texture, which is basically the slot where all the ambient occlusion gets baked into. Like I've shown you already, you can use then the geometry import live node, select the live link down on the lower right corner, 
and select the null axis. You don't need to select each single object. You just get now the whole tree, which is a blue icon. You see the icon switched over to the Cinema 4D logo, and there we have our cube. So all the colors, all the cube, all the axes have also been transferred over to Ventus. I detached now the render window, and in the second try, I'm going to make that sticky. <laughs> it will not work now. now. So here we go. I make it sticky. And now whenever I move now the cube inside of Cinema 4D, you see that the cube inside of Ventus is also moving. So you ask yourself, for what do I need that? It is very simple. When you create a virtual set, for example, for the broadcast, the guys may appear on your desk, on your artist's desk, and ask you, can you please move that table to another location? So what you're going to do is usually you're going to re-export the whole scene again, import that scene, have a look, is it OK, is it not OK? And that takes a lot of time. I created one time a virtual set, and I had to re-import and re-export all that stuff, and that took, and I was tracking that, and it took up to two hours from my whole workday. So by using the live link, you have a better control over that. So you can reposition objects, simply rebake the amino occlusion for the floor, and that's it, where the table is positioned. And there you go. And this is done in less than one minute, especially when you are used to Cinema 4D and you know your own hierarchy inside of Cinema 4D. This workflow is absolutely brilliant and takes not that much time. As you see, I have used now this cube. And to show you that, this is still a procedural object, and I can change in Cinema 4D it's a segmentation now. And the same will happen in Ventus. This is very important. So we don't need to convert all the objects to polygonal objects in first. We can still continue and work on with our procedural objects. So I'm using most times a simple effect. Well, you can use all the effects and modifiers you have in Cinema 4D, by the way. Um, and my very loved uh, uh, modifier is the shatter. Oh, by the way, to mention that, if anything goes wrong and it is not co co uh, correctly exported or live linked to Ventus, at least use the connect node. That will transform any object into a polygonal object that will absolutely be taken by Ventus. So it doesn't matter if you use Mo text or whatever else, use the connect node and you get the primitives or all the stuff you created in Cinema 4D in Ventus, no question. So I'm using now the shatter effect, and you see in live, the shatter effect is also working in Ventus. So you can create all the stuff you can imagine inside of Cinema 4D, either export this stuff or use the live link and see the results immediately. And I don't have that much logic now in Ventus. It's just a simple geometry import, and that's it, changing colors and stuff like that. Now I'm going to animate the shatter object, uh, this, uh, the, the shatter modifier and show you how to create an animation out of that, which you can then access even if Cinema 4D has been closed. So you have two independent scenes. So at frame 90, I want to have 100% of the strength. And then at frame 0, we go, we go to 0%. So when we move the time slider, you're going to see the shatter effect is now applied over the time uh, frame rate. And all I need to do now is use the Ventus node say, I want to have the end of the animation at 90 frames. And for big scenes, it's sometimes very funny. You, we don't have a progress bar that you see if the animation is now still transferring to Ventus or not. So therefore, I'm using the console. And then I can see creating the animation creation is done for a box. It's nothing. But if you have a huge scene, that may take a minute or two minutes. So and inside of Ventus, to access this animation, it's very easy. I'm just animating now the frame number of the loaded mesh. So basically, I can now use a mover, which is outputting simple uh, values, simple numbers. And then I use the mover with a, a value between 0 and 90 or 89 and have this animated in, one, uh, in 15 seconds, I guess. Let's see what I'm typing in there. So I'm using the mover, say, from 0, frame 0 in this case, to 89 in 6 seconds. There we go. Then I'm going to link or bind the frame amount to the mover. And you have the simple animation 
running. If you're now going to save this, um, you have the animation saved in Ventus as a Ventus scene, and the role scene is saved. But still, the live link is active. That means when I switch over to Cinema 4D or open that later on, um, you can still access a live link and modify all the values, like colors, textures, and so on, and so on, and so on. So as soon as Cinema 4D is back up and Ventus detects that, the live link is re-established, and all the changes can go on then. So now we can create textures and stuff like that on top of that what we already have. When you want to create content inside of Cinema 4D for a real-time application, it is very important that you understand the workflow or the idea behind a real-time engine. It's the same like for a game engine. Um, that means the textures cannot be shaders inside of Cinema 4D. Um, you should use this, the, the old school, the standard texture sets, like having a diffuse texture, an amino occlusion, a specular textures. All these things can go over to Ventus. You're not able to have shaders and then transfer it to a real-time engine. Well, maybe if you have an engine which supports HLSL code and the code is absolutely the same like in Cinema 4D, for example, that would work properly, but not with us. We are there more a classical 3D rendering engine but capable of doing roughness, image-based lighting, and supporting all these texture types as well, just for info. So if you're creating textures inside of Substance Painter, you export them as a texture set, and you can simply load them into Ventus, and they look exactly the same by using an HDR environment map and so on. So here I created a NASCAR a long time ago, um, which you have seen is very highly detailed. That means even the motor, the engine, everything is there, all the cables and connections. Everything is still inside of that car. And now I'm going to import and live link this model into Ventus. The idea is sometimes that broadcasters want to have the NASCARs running on the stage and they want to explain uh, which car model is used now for this driver, what the engine looks like, and so on. They want to open the front of the car to have a look inside, and the cameraman, which is who is using a tracking, will also go really deep with the camera inside of uh, uh, the front of the car. This is possible with Ventus, so we don't care about polygons in first. So what, what, where it consumes a lot of performance power is for heavy textures, for all the logics in the background, and all these things together may produce a high performance, but not for the polygons in first. So we have scenes where you have two, three millions of polygons. This is common because people want to have a real product presentation and don't want to use low poly like it is common for games. So this is also where our strength is. Yeah, as you see, we have now this object live linked in, into Ventus from Cinema 4D. I'm going to pin that again. And since we have so, uh, such a heavy load from polygons and objects, this, act, uh, this, this takes a while until Ventus realizes, ah, the object has moved. You will never, ever run a real presentation with Ventus with the Cinema 4D live link in the background. Later on, when you finish the project, this is a whole finished presentation, and the live link is then cut off. So all the animations, textures, and stuff are already in Ventus. So then it works absolutely flawless and very, very fluid. As you see, you have all the elements now in Ventus. You can also combine or make them compact to have a better control over the elements inside of Ventus. But as you see, I've each wire, everything is accessible, ac accessible from within Ventus. We have improved since the last versions Ventus a lot when it comes about material processing. So that means all the materials are now unique materials, but you can also extract these materials, have a one core material, and then bind all the other materials, which are the same, basically, to only one single node. That means when you change a material later on, all the other connected materials would change, therefore, as well. Here you can load all the other material stages. As you see, the material editor can be a very huge and complex thing, by the way, but you have the absolute creative freedom, therefore. So again, I'm going to show you that live again. 
We have here a cube, the null object. I'm going to use my Ventus tags. Have the setup link. Create the object link. Here are all the settings. And for now, I'm fine with the material color. Going to move my cube a bit up. Switch over to Ventus. Have a new scene. The geometry import live. Link that object, and we have it here. Now we're going to pin it, just to see that we have that the changes are really appearing on screen. And whenever I move the object, it immediately moves in Ventus as well. Applying this so beloved shatter effect. Right now we have just a low poly count of one, so that means we have just four sides that will move right now. Uh, six sides, sorry. There you go. So this is basically it, how you create a live link, how you create content inside of Ventus, and bring that things over for broadcast-ready applications. This is really a daily business. So you really create simple models, or even complex models, in your 3D application like Cinema 4D, texturizing animation, everything like you do usually as well for other things like motion graphics. And then you are able to live link these things into Ventus or import that by using any kind of import, uh, export format. Um, import these things into Ventus and then you start to really fine tune the things by applying movers or timers whenever an animation should happen, reposition the objects and there you go. When it comes about tracking, we un, uh, support all the tracking systems which are on the market, like Trackman, Equipment, Moses. Um, we, we have Stipe and all these big players, which are really implemented into Ventus. They take care of the data. They make a connection to the Ventus machine just by a network cable or whatever else. You type in the address for these networks, and therefore the link is established between the tracking systems. Um, Ventus itself, the default camera, which you cannot access right now, but Ventus itself will now then accept this tracking data and all the cameras inside of Ventus will now already move to the tracking data they receive. If you want to explicitly say, I want a camera to be able to use the tracking information, I just simply need to switch over here to tracked and tracked for the projection and the view. And therefore, now this camera is recognized as a tracking camera, and all the data that you get from the tracking systems are already used by Ventus, and the camera will move on. So we don't care about the stuff that got delivered from the tracking systems. That's really that easy. So you have your models already in the scene. You have one origin, which is the 000, zero, zero coordinates. You can then say to the tracking system operator, hey, please, move my origin to this point here, yeah, and all your models you have created and, and the origin will exactly be here. The important thing you have taken into account is the ground floor. So it looks very uh, strange when the ground is here in your 3D application, but the rear ground is here. So that looks a bit strange when the camera moves. That happens a lot. So take care that you please have all the models on the ground, and therefore the tracking system can go around and they fit absolutely perfectly in place. So basically, that's how it works with tracking systems. We don't need to do that much stuff as artists. That's the idea behind. So technically wise, we are really far away from the tracking stuff. We can concentrate on creating the content. We can concentrate on repositioning the models, give them a nice look, adding IPP effects we have available for vendors like glare, bloom, and lens flares, and all that stuff. So that's where I concentrate on when I'm on the field, by the way. On stage, for example, it looks like this here. Just a second. Here we go. And this is the animated and finished model inside of a real view. You don't believe that. After I received the model, the whole process, including creating the swirl animation and these effects you see, like uh, have interlaced lines appearing and this glow and so on, this whole thing 
took me a half hour live on stage there because they had the idea to say, hey, is this possible with one of our models? I said, absolutely. I mean, the most clients don't believe that until you do that live, sitting down there <laughs> and doing and creating the stuff on stage. So they've been very impressed to see their own character, their own model, inventors, and then live on the stage. I can give you a deeper look into Ventus if you're interested in from tomorrow on. So today the show is nearly over. I hope you enjoyed the show so far. And if you have any questions, just pass by. I'll be here next to the table. If you have any questions about Ventus, about the broadcasting stuff, about the tracking, about Cinema 4D stuff into Ventus, how to get all the best things out of Cinema 4D for the broadcast. So thank you for your time.